Good afternoon. Welcome to the Sherman and Sterling World Championship Round of the 2005 Sherman and Sterling International Rounds of the Philip C. Jessup International Law Moot Court Competition. Thanks to all the teams and coaches for an incredible competition so far this week. This is just the capstone to something that started back in early September for all of you. At this time, we're going to go straight to the round. I apologize for the delay. Thank you all for coming. This is going to be a very exciting round. The International Court of Justice is in session. The distinguished panel consists of President Higgins and the Honorable Judges Crawford and Carter. Good afternoon. Please be seated. May it please the court. My name is Siti Aliza Alias, appearing on behalf of the respondent, the Kingdom of Raglan. With me is my co-agent, Ms. Malati Abdul Hamid and table counsel, Mr. Ng Boon Ka. Your Excellency, me and my co-agent will each be taking 21 minutes of this court's time, and we reserve three minutes for sir rebuttals. Yes. Your Excellencies, I will be dealing with two issues, firstly, regarding the scuttling of the Mairi Maru, and secondly, regarding the piratical attack and piratical activities in the archipelago, and the other two issues will be dealt with by my co-agent. And I shall begin with Raglan's first submission, that it is not responsible for a breach of international obligation in the scuttling of the Mairi Maru, because the scuttling of the Mairi Maru was done due to exceptional circumstances that justify its action. Your Excellencies, the Kingdom of Raglan is invoking its right as a coastal state to take defensive enforcement measures upon a foreign vessel on the high seas when there is a threat to the interests of its coastal nation, Your Excellencies. This right, known under international law as a coastal state's right of intervention, we submit is a rule of customary international law. This is because what sort of threat you, you put it at a rather low threshold when there is a threat to the coastal state. Does it does it not have to be rather more than that? Your Excellency, according to the Intervention Convention, the threat must be an imminent threat. Uh, but according to UNCLOS, uh, merely a threat to the coastal state and uh, or its related interests. But we will prove to this court that there was an imminent threat. Firstly, I shall establish that the rule on intervention itself is a rule of customary international law because it has been adopted. Firstly, it has been acknowledged by the ILC in its report in its 1980 yearbook. And furthermore, the rule of intervention by a coastal state has been adopted in various international conventions and instruments. For so example... Mr. Lais, Mr. Lais you, you, you talk about coastal state, but this occurred outside the EEZ. And as I understand the facts, there was no actual pollution of any area over which the respondent had sovereign, sovereignty or sovereign rights. That being so, weren't you just in the position of any other state? Precisely the rule of intervention, Your Excellency, is that when there is a threat of pollution that will trend, threat the coastal state, that will threaten the interests of the coastal state, although the pollution has not yet reached the territorial waters of the coastal state, it gives right to the coastal state to intervene on the high seas <coughs> upon a foreign vessel in order to stop the threat of the pollution from spreading to its coastal nation, Your Excellency. For example, in the Tory Canyon case, where United Kingdom had bombed a Liberian oil tanker outside the territorial waters of the United Kingdom because there was a threat of the oil pollution spreading and endangering the interests of the United Kingdom in its uh, coastal area, Your Excellencies. The court now calls upon Ms. Hamid. Thank 
Madam President, Your Excellencies, a very good evening. May it please this honourable court, my name is Melati Abdul Hamid, representing the Kingdom of Raglan, the respondent in the present proceedings. I propose to take 21 minutes of this honourable court's time in order to submit on two main arguments. Raglan's first main argument is that Apollonia has an international obligation to give prior notification to Raglan with regard to its mock shipments through Raglanian archipelagic waters and Apollonia had failed to do so. Secondly, Apollonia also has an international obligation to pay compensation to Raglan for the damage at the Northern Shallows for the injuries suffered by Raglanian ecotourism and sport fishing industries there. Each point will be dealt with in turn. Your Excellencies, may I begin my submissions proper? Certainly. Much obliged. With regard to the first submission, we, ex we submit that Apollonia has an international obligation to give prior notification to Raglan with regard to its smart shipments through Raglanian archipelagic waters. Your Excellencies, the Mairi Maru was exercising the right of sea lane passage while traversing through Raglanian waters. This is due to the fact that, according to the clarifications, Raglan had designated sea lanes and the Mairi Maru followed the sea lanes in its passage. And by virtue of Article 53 of the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea, they have the right of sea lane passage. From the illustrations that we have submitted before this honourable court, therefore we submit that there is a customary duty to give prime notification to coastal states for nuclear ships. Your Excellencies, our alternative argument is that there is what also... What do you say to, to the, the argument um, from your opponents that the real major transporters and the United Kingdom and the United States were mentioned um, do not regard themselves as under a legal obligation to notify. How do you put in the balance that practice against stated positions by large numbers of countries who are probably not much in the business of transporting mocks? Your Excellencies, with regard to the duty to give prior notification, the specially affected states are the coastal states through whose waters their nuclear materials are being transported. This is due to the fact that they are not benefiting from the transportation or the, most of them are not um, benefiting from the commercial gains of the transportation, export and import of the nuclear materials. Will it be Ms. Alias uh, who will do the rebuttal? Ms. Hamid, I think. Your chief. So Ms. Hamid is coming back to talk to us again. Madam President, Your Excellencies, I have two quick points to make. Firstly, with regard to the customary nature of the duty to give prior notification, we would like to prove again that there is a custom to give prior notification by referring to the, re the two regional customs of Mediterranean nations and Association of Caribbean States, and also the more than 100 national legislations which does impose the duty to give prior notification for nuclear ships transporting nuclear materials through the waters. Your Excellencies, it is apparent that when, if I may quote, he threatened to detonate the device if the captain and the crew did not surrender control of the ship. Aware the Raglanian pirates did not generally harm their victims, and in order to minimize the loss of life, the captain agreed. It is apparent to the captain that he was acting as a private pirate and not as an agent of Raglan when he threatened to detonate his explosive device. Thank you very much. May it please this honorable court. Yeah. The court will now rise and uh, deliberate and will resume the session in due course.
Please be seated. The, the tribunal um, wants to begin by saying that it's very much appreciated everything it's heard this afternoon. We know the, uh, the teams have had a very long road to, to come here, that it's not just been today, but everything that has gone before for not only, again, the oralists we've heard, but those who've supported them and, and their coaches and all the many people involved in getting you to where uh, you've been today. We're also aware that you had to select key arguments to put to us because of constraints of time, but we realize uh, both from uh, the, the memorials and the very nature of the case and from what we've heard come through, um, even lightly in your arguments today, that you have clearly done enormous amounts of work on also many other areas you weren't fully able to deploy uh, before us uh, today. You can, in fact, all feel uh, very proud of yourselves. Now, um, I'm going to uh, start uh, with the individual presentation for the best oralist, and uh, then I will tell you the court's views on the team winner. Again, we felt all of you did very well. Um, a credit to your teams. Alias, we admired the way you dealt with the difficult situation of so much being thrown at you and came back and uh, gave us more good analysis. But overall, uh, we feel that Ms. Hamid must get uh, the Individualist Award. <laughs> I would like to say we were impressed by her ability to handle the barrage of questions, marshal uh, arguments very rapidly in response, and while doing so, bring in new elements that she had not previously deployed, and that showed a considerable advocacy skills.